Right. Our presentation, our third installment, is simply entitled, The Victory of Surrender. Amen. <clears throat> now, actually, uh, I have some notes here in my backpack I'm going to grab. I printed notes this time. Now, our last presentation, we were looking at the seven seals. This time we're going to start with the seven trumpets. And so let us turn to Revelation chapter 10. Revelation chapter 10. And just give me an amen when you arrive there. Revelation the 10th chapter. And once again, these seven trumpets represent seven periods of time relating to God's church. So Revelation chapter 10, and we are actually going to read verse 7. It tells us, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. And so the voice of the seventh angel, this is the seventh trumpet, and we're told that something is to be finished. What is that something? The mystery of God, which tells us that it had a beginning and it has been developing throughout history, but it will be finished, completed, perfected in this seventh trumpet. Now, if we go to Revelation chapter 11, the very next chapter, we get some insight on when this trumpet began. Now, let me ask you Bible students in the Old Testament sanctuary. What apartment of the sanctuary was there a judgment day? Where there was a separation between the righteous and the wicked. The most holy place. And it was on the special day of atonement. The high priest would enter into the most holy place. They would afflict their souls. And we read in Leviticus chapter 23, those who did not afflict their souls were cut off from the camp of Israel. So there was a judgment day, a separation between the righteous and the wicked. Now we know that Hebrews chapter 8 tells us that Christ is our heavenly priest and that really the Old Testament sanctuary is just a shadow, a type, a replica, if you will, of the heavenly sanctuary. And when we study out the Old Testament priest and his work, we can get a better understanding of our New Testament priest. You could call him Jesus Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. Amen? Amen. Yes. Now, in Revelation chapter 11, we'll pick it up in verse 15. This is once again talking about the seventh trumpet, when the seventh angel sounds. Verse 15, it says, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So we see that during the seventh trumpet, dominion is being proclaimed and given over to Jesus Christ. Then if we jump down to verse 18, says, and the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be what? Judged. judged. So we know that when the seventh trumpet sounded, a judgment began, and it started with the dead. It says that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and to them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. Now, we're going to read verse 19, and I want you to tell me. Given the article of furniture described, what compartment of the heavenly sanctuary is John looking into? Mm. Verse 19, And the temple of God was opened in heaven. So this is a heavenly sanctuary. And there was seen in his temple the what? Ark. Ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. So what compartment of the heavenly sanctuary is John looking into? The most holy. The most holy. Now he's looking prophetically because these represent periods of time. So he says, look, when the seventh angel sounds, judgment began and the most holy place was opened so Christ could go in. He follows the Father in, according to Daniel chapter 7. So this seventh trumpet began in the year 1844. So are we living in this seventh trumpet? Oh, yeah. Amen. So once again, God gives us prophecy, not just so we can, you know, be... Wow. A prophetic people and, and gloat about it, but he's trying to tell us this is where we are in earth's history. So we're living in the seventh trumpet and in the sixth seal. And we're told that during this seventh period of time, which is the last period of time, by the way, we're living in the last days. 
It says that the mystery of God will be finished. The question is, what is this mystery of God? Well, allowing the Bible to interpret itself, I want us to go to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians, the first chapter. Colossians 1. And let us go ahead and start in verse... Let's start... In verse 24, verse 24, this is Paul speaking, Colossians 1, 24, are we there? Amen. Amen, all right. It says, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but is now made manifest to his saints. Amen. Verse 27, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is, say it with me, Christ, Christ in you, you, the hope of glory. glory. So the mystery of God is Christ in you, the hope of glory. In other words, Christ being at one mint, that's what the word atonement means, with his people. Amen. And then we read here the result of this mystery in verse 28. It says, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul, he mentions this mystery throughout his writings. Let's go to Ephesians. Ephesians couple books before Colossians. Ephesians chapter 5, when he's talking about marriage. Listen to how he speaks of this great mystery. Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 31. Ephesians 5 and verse 31. As Paul speaks of this mystery. He says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be what? One. One flesh. Then we read in verse 32, This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. And so this mystery of God is Christ in his people. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And the effect of this mystery, divinity combined with humanity, is the perfection or completion of of Christian character. We on the same page? Amen. Now, back to Colossians. I forgot to mention this, but Colossians, we read the very end of Colossians chapter 1. Now, I think most of us know that the chapter divisions were not in the original Greek or Hebrew language in the Bible. So, this was just one solid letter. And so, the first verse of chapter 2 is just a continuation of what we've read in chapter 1. And I want us to keep in mind who this, this message was also intended for. It was not just the Colossians, but it was also for another church. Colossians 2 and verse 1. He says, For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you and for them where? At Laodicea. And for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. Now we're going to revisit Laodicea a little bit later. But I want to read a quote from Ministry of Healing. This is from page 180, paragraph 5. She says, the Savior took upon himself the infirmities of humanity and lived a sinless life that men might have no fear that because of the weakness of human nature, they could not overcome. Amen? Amen. Then she says, Christ came to make us partakers of the divine nature and his life declares that humanity combined with divinity does not commit sin. Mm. Humanity combined with divinity does not commit <gasps> sin. Now, I want us to get a second witness. Let's go to another prophet of God, 1 John, chapter 3. 1 John, chapter 3. And give me an amen when you arrive there. 1 John, the third chapter. And we're going to start in verse 6. 1 John 3 and verse 6, which tells us, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. Okay. Now, why would he say this? It's because he knows that what he's about to talk about, Satan is going to stir up a whole bunch of deception 
involving really the topic of true righteousness. So he says, verse 7, little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. So it's not simply a declarative judicial righteousness, but it is a living, working righteousness when Christ is inside the heart of a human vessel. Amen? That's what he's trying to tell us. It's not just a proclamation, it's a demonstration of righteousness. Then he says in verse 8, He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. And so we know that the key to having victory over sin is to have Christ living in you. He will live out his righteous life in you. That's why he wants to give us his righteousness. We can't produce it in of ourselves. So Christ will actually live in us and produce this righteousness. Amen? Amen. And so the Bible and the spirit of prophecy testify that humanity combined with divinity actually cannot sin. Christ is not going to sin while he has complete authority over your heart. I'll say it that way. If Christ is in you, he's not going to commit sin. And so if we're surrendered to the Lord, that is the true key to having victory. Amen? Amen. Now, this is why you read verses. These would usually be on the screen. But Hebrews 13, verses 20 and 21 it says, Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So we see this language that Christ wants to work in us to do his, his good will. We even read that directly in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. It says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, as ye have always obeyed, and not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Then he says, For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So Paul is describing that there is a cooperation that must take place, but ultimately God is doing the work. We just need to submit to him. Amen. So he says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, because God wants to work in you. Amen? Amen. So... The Hebrews verse was Hebrews uh, chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. Hebrews 13, verses 20 and 21. Now, we receive a description of this group of believers. This has kind of been our focus today. But we receive a description of this group of believers that will be the product of the mystery of God being completed or finished. Okay? And we've read these verses, uh, I think, in both of our presentations earlier, but we're going to read them again. Revelation chapter 14, starting in verse 1. Revelation 14, starting in verse 1. Just give me an amen when you arrive. Amen. amen. And it reads, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion, and with him an hundred and forty and four thousand having his father's name written in their foreheads. Jump down to verse 4. It says, These are they which are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. They're spiritually pure. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. And so this special group of believers in the last days will perfectly reflect the image of Christ Jesus. Now, you know, in generations past, any individual can be perfect in Christ Jesus if you are surrendered to the light that you know. Amen? Amen. I hope that's clear. Yes. But this last generation will receive all the light that a fallen human being can possibly receive. And they will reflect Christ's character more than any human being that has lived. You know, I believe Martin Luther reflected Jesus Christ. Amen? Yes. But Martin Luther did not have all of the light. He didn't understand about the Sabbath. He said some pretty horrific things about Jewish people, okay? Yeah. But he really didn't know any better. But I believe he lived up to the light that he did know. So he was perfect in Christ Jesus. But these people will reflect the character of Christ like no other generation. And they will go through a time of trouble like no other generation. Now I want us to look at an important 
reason why the finishing of this work is so crucial to the great controversy. Why is it important? Well, we read several verses. This is Psalm 79 and verse 9. Psalm 79 and verse 9. Normally have these scriptures on the screen, but let's turn there. Let's turn there. And in fact, can I get a reader? Someone who could read loudly for us. Psalm 79 and verse 9. Help us, O God of our salvation, for the glory of thy name, and deliver us, and purge away our sins for thy name's sake. Okay. So notice the motivation of this prayer. He's praying and he says, help us, God, for our namesake. Hmm. He doesn't say that. He says, help us, God, for your namesake That's right. hmm. and for your glory. Hmm. And so his main motivation is not even his own personal salvation. His main motivation is God's glory. Mm -hmm. Now, salvation is a great motivation. Amen. Everyone wants Amen. to be saved. I sure hope so. And Christ can save all of us. But. Even above our own personal salvation should be God's glory. We also read Jeremiah 14, verse 21. It says, Do not abhor us for thy name's sake. Do not disgrace the throne of thy glory. Remember, break not thy covenant with us. Aren't these interesting verses? We also read in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 12. He says, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. And so you notice that a, a true righteous and holy man or woman, their main motivation is God's reputation, the vindication of God's character. Now in Patriarchs and Prophets, she kind of sums this up very nicely. Page 68, paragraph 2. She says, but the plan of redemption, that's redeeming man from sin. She says, the plan of redemption had a yet broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of man. It was not for this alone that Christ came to the earth. It was not merely that the inhabitants of this little world might regard the law of God as it should be regarded, but it was to vindicate the character of God before the universe. And so this last generation, they're not going to be walking around saying, oh, we've been perfected. Look at us. We reflect the image of Jesus more than anyone else. They're going to be searching their hearts. They're going to be falling at the throne of Jesus, humbly. And their main motivation, their main goal is God's glory. Amen. God's glory. Now, the reason that God's name needs to be vindicated is because a certain individual that he created perfectly broke his law for the very first time. What was his name? Lucifer. Lucifer. For Adam, we had Lucifer, but I, I see where you're going with that. Lucifer, okay, he was the very first one to break God's law. Now, I want us to understand this. We know that God's law is a reflection of his character, amen? amen. The same God that says, thou shalt not commit adultery is the same God that says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He's always faithful. Mm -hmm. The same God that says, thou shalt not lie is the same God that says, I cannot lie. I'm the true witness. The same God that says, thou shalt not murder does not commit murder. And so it's simply a reflection of his character. And Jesus Christ, who is the perfect image of the Father, kept the law perfectly. He came to represent God. He was God in the flesh. And so when Satan broke God's law, he was saying there's something wrong with God's character. If the law is worth breaking, that means there's something wrong with the law and something wrong with the law giver. There is a flaw in the government of God. And so this is an accusation. And so God will do his due diligence to disprove these accusations, and you and I have been placed in the middle of this great controversy. I want us to get a glimpse of this for a moment. Let's go to Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. If you have trouble finding Job, just find the book of Psalms. It's just before that. Job chapter 1. We're going to get a glimpse into the great controversy. And what God wants to do through us in order to vindicate his name. Give me an amen when you arrive. Amen. Get your water. Job chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 6. 
Job chapter 1, starting in verse 6. It tells us, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and who came also? Satan, Satan came also among them. Verse 7, And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Now leave your Bibles open. We're going to pause there. We have this heavenly council that's meeting together, and we have Satan present. Okay, so Satan is a part of this heavenly council. And God asks him, where have you been, Satan? Now, did God know where Satan had been? Yes. yes. So he's asking this question for the sake of the party that's involved. The sons of God in this heavenly council. And Satan says, I've been going to and fro. Where? Yeah. Earth. Planet Earth. Now, do you think Satan is simply telling God, yeah, I was vacationing on planet Earth? Yeah. No. I'm going to submit to you that Satan is actually boasting to God. Yeah. He said, I own this earth. Amen. And your precious uh, beings that were created in your image, they're in my image now. They obey me. And listen to how God responds to this. Verse 8. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? That there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. And so God, he challenges Satan. Satan says, I own this earth. All your precious creatures, they follow me now. And God says, well, have you considered Job? Job doesn't serve you. Job fears me. He serves me. Now, how does Satan respond to this? Verse 9. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for nothing? Hast thou not made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance has increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. I want us to think about this for a moment. Is Job present in this heavenly council? No. no. So this accusation, yes, he's accusing Job, but ultimately he's accusing God. He says, hey, this man only serves you because you give him nice things. You've blessed him. But if you were to take everything away from him, he would curse you to your face. In other words, Job doesn't love you because of who you are. He loves you because of what you give him. And, and how does God respond? Verse 12, And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And I think most of us know the story. Everything gets taken from Job. Everything. And what's his response? He says, Blessed be the name of the Lord. And it says, Job did not sin. Then Satan comes back. They have the same conversation. And this time God says, okay, you could touch him. Just don't kill him. And he's, he gets these horrible uh, boils on his body. And he's scraping them off. And even his wife turns on him and says, well, you know, just curse God and die. But he says, blessed be the name of the Lord. He does not sin. So I want us to think about this, this dynamic, this great controversy. Because I believe Job is a type for the 144,000. He goes through a great time of trouble, and yet he's victorious by the grace of God. And at the end of it all, whose character is really vindicated? God. God's. God chose to use human instrumentality to vindicate his name. He chose to use a human being to disprove an accusation of Satan. Do we see this, friends? God wants to do this with this final generation, but on a broader scale. Where Satan will say, hey, God, look at this. Look at all of the murder and the rape and the immorality. There's no one who serves you on this earth. I own planet Earth. And God will point to a special group of people and say, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Amen. And it will vindicate God's character. Amen. It'll be like a slap in the face of Satan. And it will be shown that we serve him even when everything is stripped from us in the time of trouble, Satan's going to try his hardest. But at the end of it all, it'll show that we serve God, not because he gives us nice things, but because God is love. Yes. And the entire universe will know this group of people, they serve God, not because of the blessings, but because of the blesser, God himself. Amen. So God wants to do this mighty work through his people to finish the mystery of God. 
to redeem his beloved creation back into his image and vindicate his name throughout the entire universe. Who wants to be a part of this work? Amen? Amen. 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 This is what the Lord has for us in these last days. And so the question is, what is the holdup? We're living in the seventh trumpet. Do you think God is unwilling to dwell in his people? No. No. You know, we were created for God to just simply have fellowship with us. There's no fault on his part. It is us that are holding him up. Because he will not force himself. I'm going to submit to you that standing in the way of God accomplishing this victory is our unwillingness to surrender. That's right. Our unwillingness to surrender to God. Now in Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, it says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Amen. I want us to think about this word peace for a moment. If two nations are at peace, that means that there is an absence of what? War. War. There's an absence of conflict. And so to be justified by faith is not by feeling. Some people think peace is just a feeling. Well, you could feel very peaceful while you're living in your sin. So it's not a feeling. The Bible says it's by faith that we feel this peace. I can confess all my sins with a contrite spirit and still not feel it. That doesn't mean that God didn't forgive me if I was genuine. And so it's by faith, not by feeling. And we want absence of war with God. Well, what put us at war with God in the first place? Sin. It was sin. The Bible says the natural man is at enmity with God. While we were enemies with God, he died for us. And so we're fighting against him. We're enemy, enemies with him. But I want us to think about this. Is God our enemy? No. no. Is God fighting against us? No. no. There's no fault on his part. So in order to have peace with God, we need to simply cease fighting Him. We need to surrender Amen. and lay down our carnal weapons and say, God, I'm done fighting you. By faith, I'm, I'm done. I'm not going to fight the Holy Spirit anymore. I'm not going to push Him aside and do things my own way. That's really what the faith of Jesus is. Jesus says in John chapter 5 and verse 30, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. So Jesus Christ, he came to set the example. He says, look, don't do things your own way. Stop fighting God. Surrender. Amen? Amen. That is how we have true peace with God. Now, what church did Paul mention in Colossians chapter 2? Laodicea. I want us to turn to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation, the third chapter. Now, we've looked at the seven seals, well, really only the seventh seal, but, uh, the, or the fifth and the sixth seal. We've looked at uh, the seventh trumpet. Now we are going to look at the seventh church. And I'm going to submit to you that these seven churches also, they were local literal churches, but they also represent seven periods of time dealing with God's people. That's what all these groups of seven are in the book of Revelation. And the seventh church, I'm going to submit to you, is you and I, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So I want us to start in verse 14. And I believe that Jesus is going to give us the recipe of surrender. Because the question is, how do we actually surrender? How do we actually do it? Jesus gives us the recipe and the message to Laodicea. So starting in verse 14, it says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen. The faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I want to pause there for a moment. Jesus calls himself the true witness. You ever have somebody come to you and they say, I just need to tell you the truth. Yeah. Yeah. Is that usually going to be... Uh, it's usually bad. It's usually bad, yeah. <laughs> it's usually going to be something that's hard to hear, right? And Jesus, he's telling us, look, I'm the true witness. I cannot lie. No one can say, no, 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 that's not true. He says, look, I'm the true witness. I cannot lie. And what he's about to tell us can be very hard to swallow. He says in verse 15, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would or I wish that thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. In other words, there's a separation from the body of Christ. There's a shaking that happens because of this lukewarm condition. 
And then he says in verse 17, Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Wow! He really lays it on. But he doesn't stop with just diagnosing the problem. He also gives us a solution. Amen? Amen. He tells us in verse 18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. So he gives us a solution. Then he tells us why is he giving us these harsh words. He says in verse 19, as many as I what? Love. Love. I rebuke and chasten. and be zealous therefore and repent. Then he tells us, verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him. Notice the language, Christ in you. I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh. Can we overcome through the blood of the Lamb? Amen. Amen. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and was set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. In other words, have an open heart. Hear what the Lord is saying to us. Amen. And so one may ask, how do I surrender to God? Jesus gives us the formula here. And I call this the cycle of surrender. In these three steps, it's humility, consent, and obedience. Humility, consent, and obedience. So repeat that with me. We don't have it on the screen here. What's the first one? Humility, Humility consent, consent, obedience. This is the cycle of surrender. Now, how does Jesus give us this, this formula in the message to Laodicea? Well, first of all, he tells us our true spiritual condition. If there's any ounce of spiritual pride in an individual, if he truly accepts the message to Laodicea, all self-righteousness is removed. You are humbled if you receive it. He humbles us. He says, look, you think that you're good. You think, oh, I'm present truth. I'm in the remnant. But he says, you don't know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. If you accept that, that's going to humble you. Amen. Amen. He gives us the solution. I praise the Lord. And then... He says, I stand at the door and I kick it down and then I force you to do this. No. No. What does he say? I stand at the door and knock. In other words, he's asking for our consent. So he humbles us. He says, look, you think that you're in an exalted spiritual condition. You don't know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I have a solution, but I'm not going to force it. I'm going to stand at the door and knock. I'm asking for your consent. And if you let him in, he promises, he says, to him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. In other words, he promises that we will live a victorious Christian life, Amen. that we will render obedience to the God of heaven because of the heart change. And so this is the cycle of surrender, humility, consent, obedience. In a nutshell, this is the message to Laodicea. He humbles us. Then he asks for our consent. And then he says, I can work out obedience. I can produce a people that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Yes. We believe the Lord can accomplish that work. Yes. He cannot lie. He promised it in his word. The question is, do we want to really surrender to him? And so I want to deal with this very first step, humility. In 2 Chronicles 7 and verse 14, it says, If my people... Who are called by my name. So he's not talking about the heathen here. He's talking about his own people. My own people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Amen. How do we humble ourselves before the Lord? If we're self-deceived, if we're filled with spiritual pride, how do we do it? I'm going to submit to you that humility comes by self-examination. What does it come by? Self-examination. Self self now, I want us to think about Laodicea. What is their worst characteristic? Some people might say that they're wretched, they're miserable, they're poor, they're naked. They're blind. Because look, if I'm wretched, miserable, poor, and naked, but I know that I am, I can seek a solution. 
But if I'm all of these things, but I'm blind to the reality of my spiritual condition, I'm not even going to think I need help. It'll be just like the Pharisee who went up to the temple to pray. He said, Lord, I thank you I'm not like this, this sinner, this tax collector. I'm, I thank you that I'm not like all these other sinners. What does the tax collector do? He doesn't even look up into heaven. He pounds his chest and says, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus says, the tax collector is the one who was justified. The one who actually saw his need was justified. This is why humility is so crucial to the Christian walk. In Testimonies to the Church, Volume 3, page 252, paragraph 4, she says this, What greater deception can come upon human minds than a confidence that they are right when they are all wrong? The message of the true witness, that's what we just read, finds the people of God in a sad deception, yet honest in that deception. They know not that their condition is deplorable in the sight of God. While those addressed are flattering themselves that they are in an exalted spiritual condition, the message of the true witness breaks their security by the startling denunciation of their true condition of spiritual blindness, poverty, and wretchedness. My friends, this is why we read in scriptures like 1 Timothy 4.16, Paul is writing to his young apprentice Timothy, he says, Take heed unto thyself. He's saying, watch out for yourself. And unto the doctrine, continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear you. Similarly, Jesus says in Luke 21, verse 34, And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with serving and drunkenness and the cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unawares. So Christ is ultimately warning us of ourselves. Desire of Ages, 382, paragraph 4. Listen very carefully. She says, Satan is planning to take advantage of our hereditary and cultivated traits of character and to blind our eyes to our own necessities and defects. Only through realizing our own weakness and looking steadfastly unto Jesus can we walk Security. So when we realize this weakness, we don't just stay there. That can be very burdensome. We realize our own weakness, our depravity, but then we look to Jesus Christ, and he's got the solution. She says, only by doing this can we walk securely. Now, writing to a minister, and I keep these things in mind, but this is the uh, Testimonies to the Church, Volume 1, 433. This is what she says. You have studied many works to make your discourses thorough, able, and pleasing, but you have neglected the greatest and most necessary study, the study of yourself. Mm -hmm. A thorough knowledge of yourself, meditation, and prayer have come in as second things. She says, when you should by faith be drawing near to Christ, you are studying books. I saw that all your study will be useless unless you faithfully study yourself. You are not acquainted with yourself, and your mind dwells but little upon God. You know, many people, they look at these faithful ministers who are preaching the truth, and then they take a hard fall. Or they just go in a direction, they apostatize, and they wonder, what, what happened? He had so much knowledge. He was such a powerful, faithful minister of the Lord. It was the same thing that caused Lucifer to fall. It was pride. They weren't examining their heart in comparison to God's character. They were neglecting the study of themselves. They got puffed up with pride, and they ultimately apostatize. That's what happened to Lucifer. So the reason we don't know our true condition as Laodiceans is because we do not study ourselves. We cannot receive the medicine until we understand how sick we are. Amen. And Jesus is the great physician. Amen. This is how humility is stirred in the heart of a sinner. Now, I want to read some of the events leading up to the crucifixion. And I want us to turn to Matthew 26 during the Last Supper. We're going to make an observation here. Matthew chapter 26, starting in verse 21. You know, sometimes I think we read scripture too hastily. We don't really meditate upon each verse. 
And this is one of those verses that for a long time I just read through and didn't really think much of it. But I want us to really analyze this. Matthew 26, starting in verse 21. Matthew 26, starting in verse 21. Just give me an amen when you arrive there. Amen. All right. It says this. And as they did eat, this is Jesus and the disciples. He said, verily I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceeding sorrowful and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, three words, is it I? Now I want us to think about this. Throughout the ministry of Jesus, when the disciples were walking with him, did the disciples have a very humble attitude? No. No. They were constantly bickering, arguing, competing to be next to Jesus. But for one of the first times, Jesus, he says, look, one of you are going to betray me. And they look inwardly and all of them say, Lord, is it I? You know, sometimes we read the message to Laodicea and we say, oh, yeah, this brother over here. Oh, he's a Laodicean. He's lukewarm. I got my problems, but man, this sister over here, man, she's got some serious issues. At least I'm not like her. But we need to have the attitude of the disciples here. We need to say, Lord, is it I? Amen. Is it I, Lord? Now I want us to jump down to verse 31. We're going to read about Peter. Verse 31. Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Verse 33. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Verse 34, Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you, This night, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should uh, die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. So this spirit of self-preservation and pride, it spread amongst the others. <laughs> and I want us to think about he's arguing with Jesus himself Jesus says look all of you are going to leave me everyone's going to desert me Peter says nope not me Jesus you're wrong <laughs> and he says you don't understand he describes the exact timing of his denial you're going to do it three times Peter before the cock crows and he still rises up says nope Jesus you're wrong I won't deny you I'm going to submit to you, if Peter would have humbled his heart and said, really, Lord, help me. What can I do to avoid this? Peter would have died with Jesus. But he didn't do that. Well, sometimes we rise up against this Laodicean message. We say, nope, Jesus, not me. I'm not the lukewarm one. But we're deceived, my friends. We're deceived. You know, lukewarm... It's not just, oh, I'm, I'm very cold or, oh, yeah, I'm kind of one foot in, one foot out. But it also is, you're really high, you're on fire, and man, I hit this spiritual low. What happened? And then I'm on fire again. Oh, I hit this spiritual low. That's lukewarm. Can anyone relate to that? That happens with me. Days I'm like, man, my devotion's so good. I feel so close to God. Then something happened and it's like, oh, all of that, forget it. God, where are you? Are you even real, God? And it's like, whoa, that is a Laodicean. And the very nature of pointing the finger is Laodicean. If you're pointing the finger at someone else and say, oh, yeah, that's a Laodicean, guess what? You're a Laodicean. <laughs> now let's continue to read about Peter. Let's actually read about his denial here. Verse 69. Verse 69. It says, Now Peter sat without in the palace, and a damsel came unto him, saying, Thou also wast with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. And when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto them that were there, This fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. Verse 73, And after a while came unto him, they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou also art one of them, for thy speech bewareth thee. Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately 
the cock crew. Verse 75, and Peter remembered the words of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. He had three opportunities to say that he knew Jesus, that he was willing to die. I mean, just moments before this, he said, Jesus, I will die for you. There he is denying him three times in a row. Cursing, cussing. Now, you know, the other gospels, they say that the moment that he denied him the third time and he heard the cock crow, he actually looked Jesus in the eyes. Do you know that? And Desire of Ages gives us some insight on this. Listen very carefully. I wish I had this up on the screen. Listen carefully. This is Peter looking at Jesus after he denies him. She says, the sight of that pale, suffering face, those quivering lips, that look of compassion and forgiveness pierced his heart like an arrow. Conscience was aroused. Memory was active. Peter called to mind his promise of a few short hours before that he would go with his Lord to prison and to death. He remembered his grief when the Savior told him in the upper chamber that he would deny his Lord thrice that same night. Peter had just declared that he knew not Jesus, but he now realized with bitter grief how well his Lord knew him and how accurately he had read his heart, the falseness of which was unknown even to himself. We cannot trust ourselves, friends. We cannot trust ourselves. Peter had failed to study himself, to humble himself before the Lord, and when the crisis came, he betrayed the Lord that he loved. And it wasn't until he looked into the eyes of Jesus that he realized the severity of his sin. That's what beholding the Lamb of God does. You know, there's a reason that there's four Gospels. There's four long descriptions of the sufferings of Jesus Christ. Anytime there's repetition like that in the Bible, it's because God is trying to get our attention. He's trying to show us, this is what I went through as a result of your sin. And that humbles the heart and ignites a love and a fervent zeal for him, which is why we ought to meditate upon the cross of Calvary. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we need to ask ourselves, what area of my life is not in harmony with God's will? Because it's difficult to cooperate with God. There's a reason it's called dying to self, crucifixion of self. Working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But I want to read a quote. This is where we're going to close. That will put this into perspective for us. And the quote is a little lengthy. But I just couldn't leave any of it out. And so I'm going to read this. This is from Testimonies to the Church. Volume 1. Page 240. This is probably my favorite quote in all of the spirit of prophecy. Testimonies to the Church. Volume 1. Page 240. Please pay, pay close attention to this. I'm, I'm going to try and get, get through this quote. What page was it? It's page 240, paragraph 2. Page 240, paragraph 2. Let us pray before we read this. Loving and gracious Heavenly Father, pour your spirit out upon us as we read this quote, Lord. Help me to get through it, and we just pray that your spirit really does a powerful work on our hearts now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. She says, and when you think that the way is too straight, that there is too much self-denial in this narrow path, when you say how hard to give up all, ask yourselves the question, what did Christ give up for me? Mm. This question puts anything that we may call self-denial in the shade. Mm -hmm. God, you want me to change my diet? Huh. In the shade. God, you want me to change the way I dress? In the shade. You want me to change the way I treat people? I have to love that coworker who gets on my nerves? In the shade. When our eyes are fixed upon the cross. She goes on to say, Behold him in the garden, sweating great drops of blood. A solitary angel is sent from heaven to strengthen the Son of God. Follow him on his way to the judgment hall while he is derided, mocked, and insulted by that infuriated mob. Behold him clothed in that old purple kingly robe. Hear the coarse jest and the cruel mocking. See them place upon that noble brow the crown of thorns 
and then smite him with a reed, causing the thorns to penetrate his temples and the blood to flow from that holy brow. Hear that murderous throng eagerly crying for the blood of the Son of God. He is delivered into their hands and they lead the noble sufferer awake, uh, away, pale, weak, and fainting to his crucifixion. He is stretched upon the wooden cross and the nails are driven through his tender hands and feet. Behold him hanging upon the cross those dreadful hours of agony until the angels of God veil their faces from the horrid scene and the sun hides its light refusing to behold. Think of these things and then ask, is the way too straight? Hmm. No. No. So my friends, oftentimes in this Christian walk, God convicts our hearts and there are things that we love and cherish in this world and we don't want to let it go. So we make excuses, we justify ourselves, we push aside the Holy Spirit. That is coming from a heart who is not meditating upon the sufferings of Jesus Christ. Because like she says, if you think the way is too straight, look at the cross. If you think there's too much self-denial, behold the Lamb of God. And anything that's called self-denial, you say, Lord, no problem. I'll give it up. You died for me. God gave his life for you. Do you understand that? The God of heaven. He had, he had no compulsion to leave heaven. He left the, the adoration of angels, a perfect heavenly bliss in the presence of the Father. He came down to the sinful world and he was slandered, he was mocked, he was rejected, he was spit on, he was crucified. And it says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. You know what that joy was? It was seeing you in eternity. That will humble the heart of the most proud sinner. Amen. When we come to God with humility, we consent to allow him into our hearts. He will work out obedience in our lives. My friends, this is surrender. Huh. And like I said earlier, when we approach God with this attitude, he's promised us. John 6, 37, he says, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. He won't turn you away. Amen. Just like that disgusting, diseased leper who came to Jesus, fell at his feet, he said, Lord, if you are willing, please make me clean. You know, he probably hadn't felt the touch of a human being in so long. He was ostracized from society. But Jesus touched him. And said, I am willing to be clean. The same thing happens when we come to God with our leprosy of sin. And we may feel lonely, cold, deserted, ostracized, distant from God. But we can have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so my friends, if you're still struggling to surrender... I want to tell you, and I could say this definitively because God has promised us, you cannot go wrong surrendering your heart to Jesus Christ. Amen. He will take care of you. You cannot go wrong. Whatever it is you're hanging on to, God has something better. He's saying, my child, please just let it go. I have something infinitely better. We could be closer with one another. We romanticize sin. We say, God, if I let this go... I'm going to look weird. I'm going to be ostracized. My life is not going to be any fun. Jesus says, taste and see. I have something better. And so my friends, do we want to surrender to the Lord? Do we really want to surrender to God? I want to give an opportunity to anyone who's struggling in this good fight and you say, there's something. Maybe it's multiple things. Maybe it's lust. Maybe it's anger. Maybe it's resentment, selfishness, pride. Whatever it is, the Lord is not just willing. He's longing to deliver you. You understand that? Not just willing. He's longing 
The heart of God is longing to deliver you from this thing. And so I want to invite you to come up. We're going to kneel before the altar together. And we're going to surrender this to the Lord. So okay, please okay. come up. We're going to kneel together. There's something. Whatever it is, if the Spirit of God is moving upon your heart, maybe you've been struggling with this thing for years, maybe your whole life, 